see, as I remember, I was raising the Good evening and welcome to Current Issues. I'm your host, Hisham Tilawi. Welcome to the program, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, we will be speaking with Robert Perry. It's going to be kind of deja vu to George Bush presidency. I know it seems like it's been years since George Bush was in the White House, but tonight we are going to be speaking with someone who wrote a book. Actually, he wrote a couple of books about the uh, George Bush presidency. But the book we will be talking to him about today is Deep or Nick Deep, actually. Robert P uh, Perry is an American investigative journalist. He was awarded the George Polk Award for national reporting in 1984 for his work with the Associated Press on the Iran-Contra story. He also uncovered Oliver North's involvement in it as a Washington-based correspondent for Newsweek. In 1995, he established Consortium News as an online firm dedicated to investigative journalism. From 2002 to 2004, he worked for the financial war service, Bloomberg. Major subjects, just to kind of give you an idea of who the guest is and kind of try to pick his brains tonight as far as what is going on in the country and what was going on in the country at the time when George Bush was elected. Twice, you know, how could a man like George Bush be elected to the most powerful country in the world? Well, we go in, uh, uh, when we talk with Robert Perry, he's going to answer that question for us. But some of the subjects that Perry uh, 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 wrote about, that Perry wrote about, um, he wrote about the, uh, like the career of uh, Army General uh, Colin Powell and Secretary of State at the time. And also, uh, he uh, wrote the uh, October Surprise Controversy of the 1980 election the Nicaraguan Contra cocaine investigation, the efforts to impeach President Clinton, uh, right-wing terrorism in Latin America, the political influence of Sun Young Moon. He wrote about mainstream American media imbalance. You know, if you listen to Rush Limbaugh, you think uh, mainstream is uh, winning and uh, the Rush Limbaugh's and the Sean Hannity's, they are a minority, and on the contrary, they have more people listening to them. Well, he uh, wrote about the United States Defense Secretary, Robert Gates, as well as many international stories. So uh, our guest tonight, a man who has spent all of his life, most of his life actually, his adult life, investigating, not just reporting. There's a big difference between a reporter and an investigator. An investigator is someone who digs deeper and uncovers the real news, not just report what someone wants you to learn. And that's basically what we have been telling you about most, I guess, in the last 10 years, that someone is actually programming your brains, programming your thoughts, wanting you to think one way until he gets away with whatever he gets away with and then by the time you figure it out it is too late to do anything about it but before we go to our guest we have uh, prepared a little report the first uh, section of the report actually is uh, just the funny things kind of want to bring you back to George Bush since it seems like it's been a long time since we've seen him and experienced his uh, speeches and uh, uh, weaknesses. So the first one is going to be a little bit funny, followed by the lies, the many lies that we heard before the country went to war against Iraq. And then at the end of the uh, report, it's going to be a couple of clips for our guest tonight. Uh, it kind of it'll, it'll set the stage for you to very much know who uh, Robert Perry is and what he is made out of. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, play this little report. It's a few minutes, and then when we come back, we will go directly to our guest for tonight, Robert Perry. I, see, as I remember, I was raised in the desert, but tides kind of, it's easy to see a tide turn. 
Did I say those words? No question that the enemy has tried to uh, spread sectarian violence. Uh, they use violence as a tool to do that. We need an energy bill that encourages consumption. Our enemies are innovative and resourceful, and so are we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people, and neither do we. We must never stop thinking about how best to defend our country. I'm the decider, and I decide what is best. The United States of America is engaged in a war against a, a uh, extremist group of folks. Families is where our nation finds hope, where wings take dream. If you don't stand for anything, you don't stand for anything. If you don't stand for something, you don't stand for anything. Fool me once. Shame on Shame on you. You fool me, we can't get fooled again. In my state of the my state of the union, our state, my speech to the nation, whatever you want to call it. At the high school level and find out that the liter literacy level of our children are appalling. I hear there's rumors on the uh, internets that we're gonna have a draft. You're working hard to put food on your family. I know the human being and fish can coexist peacefully. Tribal sovereignty means that, it's sovereign. It's, you, you're a, you're a, you've been given sovereignty and you're viewed as a sovereign entity. Okay. And therefore, the relationship between the federal government and tribes is one between sovereign entities. They misunderstand, underestimated the compassion of our country. I think they misunderstood the will and determination of the commander in chief, too. So they have a really delicate balance to walk between keeping us relatively fearful, but not so fearful that we stop what we're doing and really examine how it is that they've been waging. There are a lot of people who lie and get away with it. And, uh, and that uh, we will in fact find uh, uh, weapons or, or evidence of weapons programs that are, are conclusive. I don't think we'll discover anything myself. It appears that there were not weapons of mass destruction there. You said you knew where they were. I did not. We know where they are. They're in the area around uh, Tikrit and Baghdad and, and uh, east, west, south and north. Well, first of all, I, I have it lied. There are a lot of people who lie and get away with it. Talking about lies and your, your yeah. allegation that there was bulletproof evidence of ties between Al-Qaeda and Iraq. Was that a lie? Intelligence gathered by this and other governments leaves no doubt that the Iraq regime continues to possess and conceal some of the most lethal weapons ever devised. But are people going to find out? The truth, and the truth will say that this intelligence is good intelligence, no doubt in my mind. Uh, I don't know anybody that I can think of who has contended that the Iraqis had nuclear weapons. And we believe he has, in fact, reconstituted nuclear weapons. Saddam Hussein is determined to get his hands on a nuclear bomb. We cannot wait for the final proof. He's got him. He's got him. The smoking gun. He's got him. That could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Colin Powell didn't lie. My colleagues, every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. He has not developed any significant capability with respect to weapons of mass destruction. He is unable to project conventional power against his neighbors. Are people going to find out the truth? I have not suggested there's a connection between Iraq and 9-11. You have said in the past that it was, quote, pretty well confirmed. No, I never said that. Okay. I, I never think said that, that is... No, it's absolutely not. What I said was, uh, it's been pretty well confirmed, that he did go to Prague and he did meet with uh, a senior official of the Iraqi intelligence service. Saddam Hussein aids and protects terrorists, including members of al-Qaeda. Secretly and without fingerprints, he could provide one of his hidden weapons to terrorists or help them develop their own. What did Iraq have to do with what? The attack on the World Trade Center. Nothing! He said there were three main reasons for going to war in Iraq. 
weapons of mass destruction. Saddam Hussein has gone to elaborate lengths, spent enormous sums, taken great risks to build and keep weapons of mass destruction. The claim that Iraq was sponsoring terrorists would have attacked us on 9-11. Before September the 11th, many in the world believed that Saddam Hussein could be contained and that Iraq had purchased nuclear materials from Nigeria. The regime is seeking a nuclear bomb. Now, all three of those turned out, turned out to be false. Uh, first, uh, just if I might correct a misperception, I, I don't think we ever said, at least I know I didn't say, that there was a direct connection between September the 11th and, 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 and Saddam Hussein. And folks, we now call the neocons. And one thing that they were very big on was controlling information. They understood that by controlling information and how the American people received that information, they could control a great deal about how our country worked. And they had a phrase for this. It was, originally, this was a classified phrase. It was called perception management. And their thoughts were that if they could manage how we perceived these events, that we saw them as more frightening or, than they were, or uh, if, we, if we saw our enemies in the worst possible light and our friends in the best possible light, uh, that we would then respond and they could control us because they were very keen on that because they also had come out of the Vietnam era and they understood that having the public turn against the Vietnam War made these kinds of approaches virtually impossible for the federal government to, to deal with. So a big part of what they talked about at that time was kicking the Vietnam syndrome. It was a very big issue to them, how to do that. And they, put, and they targeted two groups in particular. They targeted the journalists because we were the gateway. We were the people who were going to be presenting the information, finding it out, and delivering it to the American people. So they went after us. The, the right spent a lot of money supporting attack groups that came after journalists. They built their own infrastructure. They had magazines. Eventually, they had newspapers. They had uh, moved into radio and ultimately to TV, as we know. But that was their idea. They, if they could build their own infrastructure and attack mainstream journalists, they could prevent us from doing the work we should do. The other group they went after was the CIA analytical division because they were responsible for presenting essentially objective information as best they could to the decision makers in Washington. So they came under attack. And the key thing there was the, the neoconservatives wanted to make the Soviet Union far more dangerous. The perception of the Soviet Union was far more dangerous than it actually was. And that would achieve a certain series of, of goals. They could get money for, for military. They could uh, engage in these brush fire wars in places like Central America and Afghanistan. And that's what, those were important elements of what they wanted to achieve. So information was always the key to them. And they came out of some theories, of so-called Straussian theories of the University of Chicago that dealt with this idea, that, if, that the, the public was there to be manipulated, that the people at the top knew best, they just had to get the people to follow. Very good. Uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, we are honored to have with us uh, tonight Robert Perry, the author of Nick Deeb, the disastrous presidency of George W. Bush. And we had given an introduction uh, for Mr. Perry and what he, uh, his history and what he did. And uh, now uh, join me in welcoming uh, Robert Perry. Robert, welcome to the program. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, thanks for having me. Um, Robert, b before we get into the uh, real uh, questions here, uh, you know, we played a little clip of uh, the stuff, the funny things, the stupid stuff that George Bush was uh, saying during his uh, presidency. Now, sometimes he was actually reading off of a, uh, uh, like a speech, like a written speech. Uh, do you know if some of that stuff, the, 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 the stupid stuff that he was coming up with, if it was written for him? I think most of the things that you played were uh, extemporaneous. Uh, I, I don't think those were were written. There have been there have been some cases. Um, uh, most famously, I, I guess, when 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 President Ronald Reagan uh, was reading off a teleprompter, 
and he was supposed to read uh, facts are stubborn things and, and read instead facts are stupid things, um, which some people thought was more appropriate considering how President yeah. Reagan approached uh, some of these issues. But I think most of those, those comments from uh, President Bush were um, examples of him trying to speak off the cuff yeah, I, I can't believe that. Uh, that well, he, and 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 couple of them, I, written. yeah, and couple of them, I, I noticed that he looked down as if he was uh, reading. I don't remember which one. I have Maybe to go had, back. No, and, and, and certainly some of the major speeches, like when he was talking about Saddam Hussein having weapons of mass destruction. Those, I think, some of those clips were from uh, fairly major addresses, like uh, the State of the Union. Right, the State of the in, Union. Uh, yes. In two thousand three. Yes. Now. L l let me get this. Uh, so, you know, your book, Nick Deeb, of course it's been out uh, for a while now, but um, uh, how could someone with the history of George Bush actually become the President of the United States? Well, that really is sort of the mystery that uh, Nick Deeb tries to unwind. How did this happen to the United States? Uh, if you think of it, if you step back for a second, it's a pretty extraordinary development. The United States, the most powerful nation on Earth, the richest nation on Earth, uh, in many ways the most educated nation on Earth, uh, in terms of the numbers of people who have gone through college and, and supposedly read lots of books. Um, and this nation, uh, I'm not sure exactly elected Bush because there's the, real, the controversy about the 2000 election, but... Uh, it certainly, the, the American voters put Bush within enough reach to he so he could at least steal the election. Uh, they got him within what half a million votes nationally, uh, although Gore did out poll him, uh, and probably Gore would have won Florida if all the legal votes were counted, but they weren't, and Bush was able to uh, use the Supreme Court to squash the recount and get in. But how did how did it happen that the that this man who was clearly not qualified or competent enough to run a, a, an organization as complicated and, 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 and important as the United States government, how did he get there? Uh, and so the book tries to look at, and, and not just, uh, we don't just bash Bush or bash the Republicans, we also look at the, uh, the, the role that the Democrats played, the role the mass media played. And the failures, the systemic failures, almost across the board at the national level, that enabled this event to occur. And we go through a lot of the specifics, uh, but we also sort of deal with it in a broader way. Uh, so you have here, but what is, what is really important is that you have here uh, a, a problem that has not really gone away. And, and so the point of the book is, well, what lessons can we learn? We haven't really learned the lessons of the Bush administration. We haven't sat back as a nation and said, oh, my God, you know, uh, this, this guy got us into two wars. He, he blew off warnings about uh, uh, terrorist threats before 9-11. He then uh, he, he gave his tax cuts when we really needed to start uh, investing in, in how we're going to solve our long-term uh, fiscal problems as a nation. He continued this idea of deindustrializing de the country. He uh, allowed these bubbles to be created on Wall Street to sort of create the illusion of, of wealth and, and, and affluence. And so we went through all of this, 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 this disaster, and the nation hasn't stopped and said, okay, now we really, made, we really you know, took a bullet here, and now we have to figure out why and what institutional changes need to be made? Instead, we just sort of moved on. And, 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 and the danger of that, and we're already seeing the danger of that, is that the same institutional problems that led to Bush's becoming president in, uh, in 2001 are back at play already. And we're heading into 2010 uh, with a very strong likelihood that the same people uh, around Bush the same Bush theories, the same Bush approaches, will be put back into power, at least in Congress, maybe at least one House, possibly two, um, without any of the recognition of what the devastation was caused by the Bush administration. It's, 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 it's extraordinary how we haven't been willing to learn those lessons. So, the, so neck deep is, a, is an effort to 
it may be a painful effort to some degree, but take the American reader back through how it happened and the various failures. And as I say, it's not just the failure of Bush. It's not just the failure of the Republicans. In fact, they arguably did what they were, what they were supposed to do. They're pushing their agendas. The larger problems, the larger failures occurred in the mainstream media, uh, with the Democrats, and with, in, in, to an extent, the broad American public in, so, in failing to stand up for its own interests. So, Bob, doesn't this really tell you that these institutions that you're talking about, they're nothing but, and these individuals you're talking about, they're nothing but actors in this big scenario that someone has written, and George Bush was just, uh, he took a part in this play, and uh, because the way you're saying that they did what they're supposed to, that means somebody had planned it for them. Now, who's that well, somebody? I, my, 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 but my point was that you would expect the Republicans to, to push their agenda, and you would expect Bush to try to win an election. The real problem is, why did that succeed? And what were the failures of the other checks and balances in our system that allowed it to succeed? And, and what is the larger problem that that points to uh, you you do have a u.s supreme court that is now a highly partisan court and it showed that uh when it ruled in december of 2000 to stop a recount of votes in florida actually actually not a recount of votes a, 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 an original counting of many of those votes uh to, it was blocked because the feeling was that since the supreme court had that there were five republicans on that were in control there were planning to give the election to Bush. They didn't want the actual count to undermine his, quote, legitimacy. Uh, because if he'd lost the actual count, that might have looked bad. So they, so they took this extraordinary step. Why wasn't there outrage? And not just from the American people. There's obviously, to some degree, Americans probably should have gone into the streets to protest the stealing of an election. But the mainstream media acted like this was just normal. Oh, and of course, we all should rally around the new president, uh, well, even though he, he lost the election. Bob, the, idea, the idea of counting votes had become an extreme concept, or partisan concept, as some called it. Bob, so, so Bob, how do, we, how do we get there is the point of the book. Okay, but Bob, I mean, again, you said the mainstream media acted as everything is normal. Now, you can't get everybody in the mainstream media to act as if everything is normal unless a message sent to all these editors and these career journalists, this is what's going to happen. So the, this, this, this mysterious, I mean, you, you call it a mystery, this power that can actually manipulate all these little pieces and bring them together for an election like that and to put somebody like that in, in, in the office, uh, did, did, what, what is that power that can actually accomplish all this? Well, well, well as, as you know, I, I came out of the mainstream media. I, was, I worked for many years for the Associated Press, for Newsweek, for public broadcasting. And so what I saw was how much of this developed. I, I arrived in Washington, D.C. as an AP staffer in 1977. So I got to see how much of this played out. Um, some of it because of stories I covered and uh, ended up being on the front lines of some of these fights. Others from, from a more, a somewhat more distance where I observed what others were doing. But, the, but I would say the, to me none of this is particularly surprising given the kinds of pressures that were built up. And some were organized. And some were just a case of people being careerists looking out for what they thought their personal interests were. Uh, some of it was out of cowardice, where people were afraid that they would be punished or lose their status, lose their, 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 their livelihood if they, if they stood up and did what they're supposed to do, at least what we're supposed to do in the sense of, say, a journalist is supposed to tell the truth and dig into things and, and try to be as accurate and, and objective as possible. Um, but what we saw was that what the right did, and it really comes out of that Vietnam period, out of that period of, the, of Watergate and the Pentagon Papers, there was a sense on the right and among the Republicans that they had to uh, build these institutions to put pressure, to sort of build a firewall against something like that happening again. There was a phrase that was used often during that, during that period of, uh, 
uh, there, there was not they were not going to allow another Watergate. Uh, and so they were not going to allow another president to be, in their view, hounded from office. So how do you do that? So they invested vast sums of money. It was actually very well conceived. It was people like um, um, uh, people like uh, Bill Simon, the former Treasury Secretary, Secretary took the lead in this. Uh, he pulled together the Scaifes and the Smith Richardson Foundation, the Olin Foundation, which he headed, and, and other right wing foundations. And they started investing their money. They, they've invested it also in, in attack groups to go after people like me, because people were journalists who wouldn't toe the line, who were actually digging up real information that went against the propaganda themes, had to be damaged and eliminated. They attacked congressmen. They had a whole special scheme, especially during the Reagan years. Uh, they called it the public diplomacy operation, to go after members of Congress that were particularly troublesome. So over time, when there wasn't much pushback, the American progressive community chose not to push back. They didn't really think media was important. That was the view of the progressives. They thought you know, organizing individuals or people out in the countryside was important. But they didn't understand the importance of information, especially in Washington. They did not invest in it. They didn't care about it. So you had a very one-sided situation where the right was applying enormous pressure. The mainstream people were sort of scrambling around to hold their jobs and, and keep their livelihoods. And, and so those of us who refused to play ball were pushed to the side, marginalized, or pushed out of the mainstream. The people who, who succeeded within that structure, uh, the Wolf Blitzers of the world, if you will, they were people who you know, got along and played ball. And they made lots of money. And so you saw this selection process. So, I wouldn't, so I'm not sure it's like someone gives an order and all of a sudden everyone falls in line. It's a process where these kinds of pressures, as they are applied sy systemically and with a consistency and with a strategy, have this cumulative effect. The brave people are eliminated. The cowardly people are allowed to rise. And so, surprise, surprise, you end up with a mainstream media like we have today. Yeah, but, but also, Bob, if we notice with uh, Barack Obama, for instance, uh, those forces, and I don't know if it's the same pressure or if it's, if it's different kind of pressure or if these people take uh, turns on applying pressure, because, you know, Barack Obama, his opponent was John McCain, who probably could not win if he was the only candidate in the United States. So somebody put John McCain opposite of uh, Barack Obama, uh, definitely with Sarah Palin, it was uh, dead on arrival for the Republicans. So these pressures, it seems to me that whoever is deciding those things, uh, the Republicans era and whatever the Republicans uh, job was, it was ended at that time and they needed to bring somebody else. Uh, and of course, it has to be the opposite uh, party, which is the Democrats, and they have to bring someone who can actually calm things down. You don't see that these, 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 whoever is writing this scenario is very much applying the same pressures um, in, in, in these different eras? Well, I don't think that, oh, that McCain was put up specifically to lose. You may be right that he was not a great candidate. <laughs> I, mean, I think he certainly wasn't. But he was the candidate. If you looked at the, what else the Republicans were putting up at the time, well, but 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 but, but Bob, Bob, we 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 proven, and I, and I hate to keep interrupting you, but we proven okay. that the media actually can make anyone win, and they could have had but, Mitt but, Romney but, uh, or somebody either, but, else but, win, but they they did not. But the media was in love with John McCain, and has been in love with John McCain for about as long as I can remember. Because they were told to be in love with John McCain. Well, no, because uh, he was he played them well. First of all, he was a military guy, and so the journalists felt they could like earn some brownie points by being really nice to some guy who was considered a, a war hero. Uh, he was a little bit of a maverick, so they kind of liked that. Uh, they essentially, they in most cases, the American um, mainstream media treated John McCain with kid gloves. They did not really look at him very aggressively or hard. Um, you know, he obviously had a lot of baggage in his past. Including like the Keating scandal back uh, back some years ago in the savings and loans. And you think no one told them? Do you think no one told them to stay away from those things? 
No, I, I think I think I think journalists. I think the way it was working was that it was considered a, a smart way to advance your career if you if you fawned over John McCain. There's something I guess you might call the conventional wisdom, and it's not. It's not like someone orders it. It's just sort of a it's a group think. There's a group think that develops about things, and a group think can often be wrong, as we've seen very painfully in places like Iraq. But that doesn't mean that the group think in Washington isn't powerful. If everyone's kind of saying one thing, or that all the smart people are supposedly saying one thing, and you're the odd man out, you're the person who says, that really doesn't make any sense. They're not gonna, you're endangering your position. Well, you're, you're not you, you, were, you were the odd man out when you, uh, when you uncovered the uh, Iran Contra and uh, Oliver North. Right. Well, that was considered a conspiracy theory for a long time, if you remember. And we were laughed at, ridiculed. Uh, we, we were able to persevere. But it was largely, uh, as you know, um, that one of uh, North's planes, uh, one of the last flights that they were going to fly, because Congress had agreed to let the CIA back in to, uh, to support the Contras, but before that money started flowing in October of uh, 1986, one of North's last planes was shot down over Nicaragua, and that, and, and that helped unravel the story that we had been reporting by that point for over a year. Um, and, and so the Iran-Contra scandal then got some traction. It was no longer something that could be covered up or, or dismissed. Uh, but basically, uh, there was a lot of resistance even then in the major American news organizations to pursue it very much. They thought it was, in some cases, they thought it was too complicated. In other cases, they, they didn't. There were people. I, I went. To, I went to Newsweek during this period, which was part of the Washington Post company, and and the word inside the the, the Washington Post company was, "We don't want another Watergate." Catherine Graham, who was the publisher, did not want another Watergate. Watergate was a very unpleasant experience for people who took part in it. There was a lot of anger and fear, and and, and it, you know we look back at it as kind of heroic and exciting, but that's not how they felt. And, and Catherine Grant did not want to go through that again. So okay. there was a real attitude within the company of let's let's just we sweep this under the rug. Let's come up with a solution. Let's say that oh, Reagan was inattentive to the details or something, and and we'll we'll wrap it up and and be and be done with it. We'll, we'll move on. Okay. That wasn't the truth, by the way, but that was became the acceptable truth. Okay. Um, but that's how it, that's that's sort of how it kind of works. There's this. There, and, and the fact that the right wing has put so much money into their own media, they're able to help shape that conventional wisdom. They're able to sort of uh, put out enough stories in the, you know, whether it's the Washington Times or the Wall Street Journal or, or you know, one of the magazines, American Spectator or, or, or Weekly Standard, or now, of course, on the radio with, uh, with, with uh, uh, Limbaugh or uh, Beck or Fox News with, with those folks. They're able to sort of shape the sort of the way this, this conventional wisdom is formed, but it, it, it also involves the mainstream press not being willing to stand up and fight for the truth. Information is hard to get. No, it, no. It, and it's not, it's, not, it's not often that obvious when you're digging it out that what okay. really is true. It takes a lot of work. At now, that. let's, so let's there are all in. these factors that go against it, but it's not like someone sort of gives you a command. It's more like there's a, it's almost osmosis of, well, I can't okay. really go there. That's too dangerous for my career. Now, uh, Bob, let, let's get into something that you speak about, which is the leaders manipulate people, and they make them believe anything that the leaders want to believe and follow them. Uh, and by the time the people find out the truth, it's too late to do anything about it. Now, what we've noticed that... All the leaders were talking about Saddam, how evil he was, and uh, weapons of mass destruction, and uh, relationship with Al Qaeda, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we need to go kill them on their streets before they come and kill us on our streets. You know, stories that even we, with the, uh, I guess the, the the capacity that we have here. Uh, from day one, we came out the gate saying, this is a lie, this is a lie. You know, there's no weapons. You know, I, I could not believe that a country wa that was under siege for 12 years uh, boycotted. Uh, 500,000 Iraqi children died of malnutrition and uh, lack of medicine. 
that we uh, s supposedly that they would actually uh, have these weapons of mass destructions when they could not uh, feed their people. Now, why the mainstream media uh, went along with the president and his cronies that were around him in spelling out this lie to the American people. Uh, I mean, you can't tell me just uh, this is a, a group mentality and they decided to do this because it was definitely, uh, if you want to call it a conspiracy, it was a, 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 a mega conspiracy where the media and the establishment were in bed together. Well, I see it more as a structural failure. I mean, and let me and just follow me for a second. What let's does that say, mean, structure of failure? Well, well, let, let, let me let me explain. Let's just say for a, for a second, just for argument's sake, that that you're a mainstream journalist in Washington, and you have some. You're not sure, and I think there was there was legitimate uncertainty. I mean, I think I, I think I, I was reporting, and we were at at our website, consortiumnews.com. We were reporting that. There was weak evidence that there was weapons of mass destruction. We were, we were among those like you saying that, that Bush was misleading the country to war was the title of one of our stories. But let's just say you're a mainstream journalist, and here's your, here's your career situation. You can go out on a limb and say, this is crap. Uh, Saddam Hussein doesn't have weapons of mass destruction. You know, it's just nonsense. And what happens if the U.S. The US would still invade? What happens if they find some? If they find some weapons of mass destruction, let's say they find some chemical weapon somewhere, which is certainly was certainly possible, there would be some residue left over from from previous times, or let's say they found some anthrax or some some stuff of, the, of a biological nature, your career would be over. You would be deemed a a, a Saddam apologist, uh, anti-American. You would have no future at all. You would lose your job. You would lose any hope of any working in the profession again. But that's not how a journalist is no, no, supposed no, 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 to but, think. But let's, say, let's say the other side. Let's say the other side. You side with Bush and say, yes, 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 there are weapons of mass destruction. And you're with the entire, there's this entire herd of people saying, yes, 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 there's weapons. Of course, we all know that. The Washington Post, by the way, reported it as fact on their editorial page. It was, and they repeatedly did it. There's no question there are weapons of mass destruction, the Washington Post said. And the Fox now, Network so, so, so and you, many you, other so networks. you go with that, right? You go with that. You know, you're, you're Fred Hyatt, the editorial page editor of the Washington Post. You wrote that. Now, okay, it turns out there are no weapons of mass destruction. It's just a complete sham. What happens to your career? Nothing. You continue to make your big money. You, you're, you're not hurt. You continue to go on. Now, Fred Hyatt... The guy who, who has acknowledged that he wrote falsely, he bought the lie, and he wrote it, and he helped, helped convince Americans this, this lie that led to more than 4,400 American soldiers dying and maybe hundreds of thousands of Iraqis. He wrote this lie. He is still in, his, in the same job. There is, was zero accountability, except for, you know, arguably Judy Miller uh, at, the, at the New York Times, who was a special case one might say she really went in deep but but for the for the vast vast majority of journalists in some of the new yorker new york times the washington post all the major news organizations with a very few exceptions they all bought into this and and, and virtually nobody was punished well so, but, and but, this... but, 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 but but i'm saying if you had been the one reporter who said gee i don't think it's true and it turned out there they found some your career would be over. So uh, the, the chances, so I'm, what I'm saying is that this rewards and punishment system you're is confirming so extreme that, of course, you know, if you're a working journalist, what are you going to do? You're going to throw your family's Bob, future away? Bob, you're confirming exactly my point that, you know, these people did not buy into it. These people were told this is how you go in to cover this. I mean, you've proven well, my all, point. All I'm saying is they weren't, they weren't told that. They knew it. They understood it. You know, if, if you're if you are if you're if you're if you're at all if you have any sense at all about you, after you've reached this point in your career, and I can tell you this from firsthand experience, I've been there. You know the dangers. You know exactly what the dangers are. It's sort of like if you're how how do you know, to, Bob? How did you feel like you know? I, I don't want to uh, go over this line here. Who set up those lines for you? Well, you can't, you can't cross. Well, you, would watch, you, would, you would see what happened to other people. 
like say in the case of, uh, of, of, of Central America, which I covered a lot, there was a guy named Ray Bonner of the New York Times, and he was a very honest, courageous guy. He wrote about the death squads that were being run. Now, the death squads were something that the Reagan people said weren't exist. They didn't exist. This was a, this was a, a communist propaganda theme. They said it was you know it was something that it was an active measure. Uh, so and so so there the various right wing groups, Accuracy Media, Brent Bazell's operation, they targeted this guy, Bonner. And, and the New York Times, which was increasingly run by neoconservatives, people like Abe Rosenthal, who didn't really share, who, who really wanted to support Reagan's foreign policy because he was a neoconservative. Um, so, you know, they looked around. They, they argued that maybe Bonner should have gone had more sourcing for something or this or that. They found little nitpicky things, and they destroyed his career. And he was hauled out of Central America, stuck on, a, on some obscure business desk in New York, and he quit. Okay. And he wandered. He basically wandered in sort of the wilderness journalistically for a number of years. He also he was also the guy that reported the El Mazote massacre, which something in the Reagan people said was also a myth. It turned out to be totally true, but it wasn't for. It was, took ten years before the El Mazote case was was confirmed by a forensic investigation by the United Nations, and and then the New York Times hastily rehired Ray Bonner. Okay. <laughs> but but I'm, I'm saying if you're if you're a working journalist, you're seeing this happen. You know where the lines are. You know where your, you know where your editor is looks at you funny, or you know it's. But I'm saying it's just not as explicit as you're saying. It's, okay. It is under. It's sort uh, of understood. Well, actually, it is as explicit, but no one wants to talk about it. It's like the big elephant in the room. Now, tell me well, something. I mean, we're, we're acting, Bob. We're acting like a totalitarian regime, like a dictator regime, without the dictator being uh, uh, visible. Um, is is democracy a big lie in the country? What happened to the republic? Well, you know, I think the there's never been a time when things have been perfect. There's never been a golden age, particularly. But I would say that um, there were times when things worked better. Uh, you know, if you look back to the 1970s, it's a time that people don't really think it was a great time in America. But I think journalistically. Uh, was a time when the major news organizations were, did stand up for for honesty and for getting information to the American people. There were some dramatic examples of that. The Pentagon Papers, when Dan Ellsberg provided uh, the secret history of the Vietnam War to the New York Times first. And the New York Times did a story. They published it. Nixon stepped in to get an injunction to stop them. and then But Ellsberg got, got a copies to the Washington Post, so they stepped up and they printed it. And the Boston Globe, they printed it. And so Nixon couldn't block all these newspapers from running these stories. Ultimately, they essentially negated Nixon's effort to hide this, 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 this secret history from the American people. That's a good example of when the press worked you know, more or less correct. But, but, but Bob, at that time, the press, Bob, at that time, the press was independently owned. Well, yes. I mean, obviously. The, now, the, the, now the, hundreds the of newspapers around the country are owned by the same person. Well, it, done it. Yeah, I, it's, it, obviously there's been a concentration. There's no question. But there's also been a failure, on my in my view, of people on the progressive side of America to push back. The the, the right wingers have been very willing to invest lots of money and, and lose it. It's not like they're trying to make much of what they do doesn't make money, uh, but they pour billions of dollars in because they feel it's important to get their message out and to win the this, what they call the war of ideas. Uh, on the progressive side in America, there's been next to nothing. They don't. The groups like Air America get started, but they never have much, enough money, and they collapse. And so it's the same with you know, so many other things. That, um, and, I, and, I, and so you have this imbalance in just what what people are willing to fund. Um, so so there are a lot of factors in here that that you should need to take into account. But I th I do think that that in the 70s there was this, there was more of a of an aggressive uh, press corps that that dug out important facts. Obviously, Watergate being the most dramatic of all all of those. But there was also the CIA reporting that that Cy Hirsch did for the New York Times, uh, exposing many of some of those crimes. And and but those but that re resulted in a pushback. And so it was a big pushback from the right. And they were able to ultimately through the, the think tanks they created and all the other kinds of. Yeah, intellectual pressures on in, um, Washington and, and the New York media, they were able to sort of turn 
this 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 ocean liner around and eventually run it back into a very different direction, one that uh, that where the press doesn't think it really should tell the truth to the American people. When I was at Newsweek, and I, probably the closest I ever came to what you're talking about, is that Newsweek people would say, you know, I would argue that our job was to, to get information to the American people. And my bureau chief said, no, you don't understand. Our job is to guide the American people. And and so that was the view they kind of developed, that the press was sort of this intellectual, this part of this meritocracy that kind of runs the country and that the people need to be sort of directed and, and so things have to be shaped. But but so the, the real fight I ended up losing ultimately was I, I would argue that we need to provide the facts, obviously in a way that makes sense so it can be understood. We need to sort of synthesize things. But we, we need to do it in an honest and fair way without fear or favor. I believe that stuff that they put on the mass heads of places like the New York Times. I believed it. The trouble was that, that I don't think people running the organizations actually believed it. They had, they, had, they had other agendas, but I think it's not as simple. All I'm saying it's not as simple as sort of here comes an edict down uh, that Obama's going to win and McCain's going to lose. It's not how it's done. It's not, not how it's done. But, well, I mean, you know, with Obama and McCain, it was obvious to almost everybody um, that McCain, that whoever these powers that want or choose or pick the president, they knew what they were doing. But uh, now let me uh, uh, move into something else that you unravel uh, in the book and um, uh, a mystery. And you say, uh, who killed the American Republic? So who killed the American Republic? Well, I think it was a it was a I want to say it was a joint operation. Um, I'm not sure any one person killed the republic. It was uh, there there were a lot of factors that came in. The, the point of the book is to examine the, some many of these key factors. Um, how do we get there? You know, as I say, what 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 forces pulled us into this place, and 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 why did the system fail so badly? The the, the system that the founders had envisioned, obviously. It's, it was never a perfect uh, system, and a lot of things happened over the two centuries. But uh, what we ended up with at this, at this crucial moment in our history was the failure to even get a sane approach toward our governance. Uh, and the, the madness that has been injected into this process, uh, which we're seeing continued. Uh, Fox News plays a big role in that, but uh, it's not alone. Um, we see these sort of incoherent Tea Party uh, uprisings uh, where people uh, don't seem to understand what's in their interest. They're arguing they want to, they want American corporations to have total control of the country, I guess. Um, they don't want even BP to be held accountable for uh, dumping oil into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so you end up with this sort of incoherent uh, position, at least for as far as, let's say, average working class or middle class Americans, uh, but it obviously does play to the interests of other people who are trying to shape and move that public into these positions. And, you know, I go back a lot to the 1980 election, as you know, um, which I found it to be an important turning point. Again, not that Jimmy Carter was anything great, but he was sort of grappling with some of the real problems of the nation. We, we, at that point, we'd gotten the budget deficits pretty much under control. They were fairly modest. Um, uh, Carter was trying to get the country to address to address this uh, its energy dependence on oil. He was trying to move toward uh, alternative energy uh, systems. He had solar panels put on the roof of the White House, if you remember. And uh, he was also trying to get peace in the Middle East. He was pushing the Likud uh, government of Israel to uh, settle. First, he got them to, to give back the Sinai to the Egyptians, but then he also wanted to push ahead on a Palestinian state, which at that time Likud was extremely hostile to. And then we had the election in 1980, which um, was another of those turning point moments. Uh, and there I do think the evidence is that there was actually a fairly sophisticated um, uh, amalgam of forces that came together to, uh, to, to ensure that Carter did not get that second term. And they put up and pushed through Ronald Reagan, and that was a major change for the United States, and it's a, it's a change we're still living with. Uh, okay. Reagan made a, for one point, Reagan you know, tore off the, the, the solar panels, 
from the uh, roof of the White House and said we're not going to care about that stuff. Um, he also uh, moved to deregulate the, uh, the you know the corporations. He uh, he he essentially gutted uh, the Environmental Protection Agency. He he wanted to let the free market do whatever the heck it wanted. He moved toward deindustrializing the nation. He broke unions. He he he, he changed the dynamic very dramatically. Um, and of course, he also moved the country into a much more of a war footing. Uh, as, and this is part of this effort then to sort of get the American people back into the mindset of going to war. Okay. The, the, the now, Vietnam syndrome had to be broken. So there was a lot that, there are different points where key elections and, and the failure of the, of the, of the, of the media and, and the various other safeguards we supposedly have in our system to, to check and to provide some check and balance or even information about it have failed. And, and so that's why I think we have to now look back through this whole era and figure out what happened. And that's been the great tragedy, I think, that I've seen as a journalist, is that there's been this huge resistance to do that. Okay. Now, when you say who killed the, Re uh, the American Republic, that means the Republic is dead. Uh, do you see a danger um, with the Union of the United States? Well, I'm, I mean, I'm in the sense of a republic in, in that the idea that there's a – you have a democratic republic, essentially, in the United States where the people – are, are um, have the ultimate power and that they then uh, bestow that power, uh, give that power to their elected representatives to act on their behalf. Um, and there are these, these various safeguards built into the system to prevent one section or another becoming overly powerful and, and abusive. That's the, that's the idea of the republic. And in that sense, I think we have uh, pretty much lost it uh, we have we have a media that is dom dominated by propaganda. We have uh, um, we've had an executive branch that's weird, way out of uh, balance with the from what the founders. Can, can we can we turn around though? Well, I don't know. I mean, I I really don't know. That's a tough question. I, I, you know, I've tried to focus on what I know the most, which is journalism, and I've I've argued fairly unsuccessfully, I should say. I've tried to raise money for. For even our website, consortiumnews.com, um, uh, and which we started in 1995, and we just sort of keep it going barely, um, even though it's a very low cost thing. Uh, but the point of this has been that what I know about is getting information, developing it, and prevent it's presenting it to the public. Um, but there's so much that has to be done. I think we do have to have a some honest foundation of knowledge. To, to build from. I think no, no real democracy can function without uh, yeah. a, 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 a substantial amount of truth in what the public understands. A public that is completely deluded with propaganda and falsehood is not going to vote or act in, its, uh, in, in, the, in the smartest way for the country or for their own self-interest. This is not going to happen. And that's what the neocons and the right understood. If you could pollute the information base enough then you could confuse and essentially disempower the the public. Uh, you, okay. could, you could get, get control um, over them, and that's where we uh, moved to. So Robert, we have a lot that needs to be done. Yeah, we only have like uh, a minute and a half left. Uh, now tell me very quickly, I noticed that uh, Rupert Murdoch and his Fox News network uh, they were on the forefront just about a year ago with the Tea Parties, where they sent uh, Sean Hannity and Glenn Beck and uh, uh, all these people to actually uh, uh, promote the Tea Party about a year ago. Now I feel that relationship has, it's either they use the Tea Party for whatever reason, but now I feel that Rupert Murdoch, and he said it, uh, I guess, about a month or a couple of months ago, he said that they don't have a relationship with any party. Uh, what happened to the relationship between Rupert Murdoch and the Tea Parties? Oh, I wouldn't believe a word that came out of Rupert Murdoch's mouth. I mean, clearly the uh, Fox News uh, has a relationship with both the Tea Partiers, and that's not a formal party, obviously, and the Republican Party. They they have a they have a desire to uh, advance their agenda, which is essentially more of a radical so is, free market. So, agenda. is the Tea Party the agenda so, of Fox Network? I think the Tea Party is largely a, a front for uh, corporate interests that that don't want to be regulated, uh, working with some people that may be well-meaning but are being funded heavily by these corporate interests. So it's, 
it's kind of a group of Americans who think they're being you know, radical and tough, but they're actually being manipulated. That's my view. Very good. Uh, Robert, very quickly, give us the website and how people can get your, bic- uh, uh, your book. Very quickly. Well, uh, the best way to go is to go to consortiumnews.com. That's one word, consortiumnews.com. And uh, there you'll see links to the book and ways to donate if you want to support okay. our work. Very good. All I have time to say is thank you for coming on. It's been an honor having you. Thanks. Good night. Thank you.